Okay. Um, uh, thank you again, uh, Greg. Um, Greg Kochanowski is a um, architect who um, we're very excited to say is an alum of um, AUD. Um, he is uh, um, uh, an architect that's been working with uh, Rios since 2007. He's the studio director of architecture. Um, he brings uh, to the studio a strong design um, and critical thinking sensibility, um, coupled with over 23 years of extensive experience in a wide range of projects. Um, and uh, I think what's you, what, what you'll see um, that he does in his professional life um, that applies to um, his research is that he thinks about um, uh, architecture and landscape architecture, and urban design holistically as a way to create new kinds of environments. Um, Greg is the recipient of the Young Architects Forum Award um, from the Architectural League of New York and has been a senior lecturer at Otis College of Art and Design. Um, and um, we are really, really thrilled to have him um, because he's been looking um, at the very issue of um, the, the year-long studio of fire conditions as they relate to urban areas. Um, and um, we um, are really excited to host this lecture as part of ARC DR3, which is an 11 university collaboration looking at um, disaster threats to cities across the Pacific Rim. Um, so if it's okay with you, Greg, what we would like to do is, is share um, the video with all of the participating universities in addition to um, the UCLA group. And then with the UCLA group, I know W.A. has explained this, but I just want to reiterate that um, this is um, the first of its kind collaboration between the MSAUD postgraduate program and the MARC-1 program. So there is a, a studio in the MARC-1 program that's looking at the topic um, of fire threat to LA, and then uh, a postgraduate MSAUD studio that's doing the same. So it, it's a really amazing and fun collaboration. Um, and, and we're so thrilled to, to have you involved in it. Um, the the <clears throat> work of the studio, the, um, the lectures um, are all gonna be compiled into an exhibition and a publication. So it would be really great to be able to talk to you about that. Um, in the future and, and hopefully too, you, you'll be able to be on some reviews if, if that's of interest. Um, great, great. So that's very it, exciting. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it would really be great to, to have your involvement. Um, so without further ado, um, here's Greg. Thank you again, Greg. Hi, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you, David, for the invite. Uh, thanks for all showing up at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Got the copy. So let me um, let me see. I'll share my screen here. Let me share. Do this a different way. Okay, can you all see a full screen image right now? Yep. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Okay. So as, um, as Jeffrey said, so this is a summary of some work I've been doing over the past six or seven years that just culminated in a publication uh, with the LA Forum and uh, LA County Culture and Arts, um, uh, Arts and Culture, I mean. And so uh, it's entitled The Wild. And so the research really started um, Back in, you know, the idea for the research started, which you all probably know this uh, very famous uh, sort of exhibition and uh, an event that happened with rising currents as part of MoMA uh, back in 2008 and 2009, published in 10, uh, where really the design community started engaging in issues of the climate crisis with scientists and policymakers, I think. Maybe it happened before then, but this was really the first time that it became of any 
a sort of consequence. Um, and uh, as I was looking at that, I was looking at LA, I've been in LA since 97, and um, uh, found it extremely excited, as uh, exciting as everybody else did. Uh, but come around um, a few years later, what we were seeing in LA was not, uh, we were really talking about rising sea levels, although we are susceptible to that for sure. But what we see, as you all know, is a cycle of fires and rains and floods and debris flows on a yearly basis. Um, and so I, that's the life I was living in. Uh, we were, we've been living out in the Malibu area since about 2000. And so we, fire has always been part of our lives uh, as we've lived out there. And so the, I wanted to begin to think through um, uh, what that would mean to the discussion of uh, the design community's role in uh, issues of fire and debris flow. And so this, uh, I bring this up here because it's an interesting, you know, as we think through Katrina, uh, there are these sort of pairings that happen between America and, uh, and other portions of the world as you guys are doing with your studio and your research right now along the Pacific Rim. Um, and Louisiana's, Louisiana's partner was really the Netherlands. And, you know, California's partner is really Australia. And I've been working with some folks there uh, in Australia, and really the partnership has been one that's been somewhat advertised. But as you saw in the fires of 2019, um, we have a quite we have different development patterns. We have different zoning and planning, um, but we have similar kinds of conditions, both with regard to having a history with fire over uh, millennia, really, uh, certainly for centuries. Um, and uh, indigenous cultures that have been part of that, living with that, um, and also contemporary kind of technologies and policies that have been trying to deal with that. So um, I only put this up here to say that as we're thinking through these issues, I'm just, this is part of another lecture and it's kind of maybe a repeat for what you guys are studying because you're already aware of this, is that there are a lot of people talking about these issues in the world uh, that we can learn from. So. I'm starting with this really, and we're gonna kind of start out and zoom in. Uh, these are satellite photos from the 2020 fires of this past September, um, where you really see now, um, we're starting to experience fires, not in just a particular locale, such as spotty fires, meaning well, there's a fire in LA, or there might be a fire in the Northern uh, part of California, or maybe there's one in, California, in Colorado. But really, we're seeing systems of fires along uh, and this September along the West Coast, and this September was really the exacerbation of that. And um, understanding this, this is not only a kind of local condition, regional condition, but kind of a national condition is, I think, a new, a relatively uh, recent way of thinking through um, uh, fires in the contemporary sense. Um, uh, and, and their impact on uh, not only specific locales, but on air quality, uh, as we all experienced uh, with uh, really affecting the West Coast, but as the um, airstream carries uh, um, the smoke um, from fires across the nation, really an implication of air quality across the entire, entire country and eventually out into Europe and other parts of the world. Um, and you know it's, it's it's interesting to note that one uh, significant fire uh, in California essentially uh, sensibly wipes out the emissions gains from policy uh, uh, in, in in the state. So uh, there's a direct correlation between advancement that's trying to be gained through uh, uh, through emissions policies and wildfire. Uh, uh, wildfire uh, that occurs in the state. So um, this issue of fire is not just one of uh, sort of thinking through uh, local destruction. Of course, it has that uh, for terms of people and property and habitat, but it's also uh, critical in a kind of an understanding of uh, the overall climate crisis and its feedback loop on uh, on the gains that are trying to be achieved globally. Um, in looking at fire, uh, you know, fires, um, these are, Los Angeles 
uh, is actually considered, you know, a fire adapted landscape, large, large swaths of it. Um, fires don't really happen in one locale and it's kind of a one-off. Um, these are landscapes that have had fire going through them for centuries. Uh, and so you can see here in just this one sort of animated GIF uh, of Los Angeles that the, re the, the repetition of fires really occurs over and over in more or less the same places. Uh, and that's because these are landscapes where uh, a fire is part of the, uh, uh, of the ecology. Uh, it's part of this place. It's, it's existed here before people were here. Um, and so as we begin to think through an understanding of fire, we are also, uh, we need to come at it with an understanding that this is something that has existed and will exist um, uh, into the future. And so it's development patterns and zoning patterns and ways of building uh, need to begin to adapt to those kind of realities uh, instead of being a kind of a super superimposition or a kind of ignoring of those systems. You can see in the bottom uh, left, the uh, general increase uh, in the amount of acres that have been burned over the last five years. Um, and, uh, and with 2019 being an exception that was pretty much taken up by, by Australia's fires, unfortunately. Um, as we sort of zoom in further, there's a tendency in these discussions to, um, as I was just doing, to think really big at 50,000 feet and look at sort of patterns of burning. Um, but this is a video of the Sepulveda Pass in 2017. Um, it just stopped, but, uh, and really this is about the interface between development and fire, what's called the wildland urban interface. And so this is, uh, this is the fires of, uh, that happened in Bel Air and just uh, around the Getty and into Topanga, um, where really uh, the, um, the city fabric um, is sort of intermixed with uh, these uh, wildlands. And I bring that up um, an example of the Woolsey Fire in 2018. This is a photo of a community called Seminole Springs of which I resigned um, and we lost our home in 2018. And I bring that up, uh, I bring that up mostly to talk about uh, that this, become, this became kind of a shift in the research uh, where um, uh, it, it went from the sort of abstract uh, studying of uh, patterns of fire and the dynamics of, uh, of planning initiatives and zoning regulations to uh, the fact that fires are really, uh, there's human toll of fires and the visceral and emotional uh, 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 task that this takes on people. Um, and uh, it really uh, illustrated to me that solutions for, or discussions around these issues uh, need to incorporate kind of local conditions, local fire safe councils, uh, fire adapted communities, in that it is those people on the ground in communities and the social resilience and the social capital that evolves within communities that are really probably the most impactful in terms of thinking through this problem. Um, because it is those people who are actually living here and their stewardship uh, of these lands or engagement with these lands uh, that is, uh, I think, an integral part of uh, uh, of, of the future and thinking through these problems. So th following that, um, so we're gonna zoom back out. As we zoom back in, we'll be doing a lot of that kind of coming back in and out through the portion of the talk. Uh, after fires um, occur, the, this, is, this is an illustration of uh, burn scarring uh, that's happened across the Western United States. And so after fires occur, the soil is uh, it's sort of chemically changed. And what it does is it creates a layer of soil uh, in these areas that is really impervious to water. Um, and so when rains come, uh, you get what's debris, what's called debris flows, or some people call them landslides or mudslides. And this is just a very simple illustrated GIF that talks about that. But it's the kind of the double whammy that you see 
uh, as part of the cycle, especially in Los Angeles, where um, this is these are photos of Montecito from January of 2018, um, where the debris flows came through after the Thomas fire burned most of the hillsides around Santa Barbara and Montecito. And so as we are thinking through this problem uh, of fire, uh, we, we really have to think through the entire ecology of fire, which also integrates um, this aspect of debris. And the ways in which debris, let's get, turn this on, the ways in which debris is uh, actually re sort of, um, repositions existing infrastructure adjacent to it. So this is from Monrovia. These are, this is a video from Monrovia at the base of the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, and, uh, oops, let's see if I can play that again. Um, and in there, the you can see K-rails in the back, or Jersey barriers. Uh, and that here, the streets of these communities are actually become channelized uh, conduits for mud and water and debris. Um, and that the K-rails actually exist in these communities for uh, five or six or seven years at a time, really, Creating, creating blight on these communities because hillsides will take that long to regenerate. Um, and so the communities are still in danger from debris flow um, at least for five or six years after a fire occurs. So that's kind of a general summary of the topic. Um, but we're gonna step back right now um, to 1869 to 1878 with John Wesley Powell. And John Wesley Powell, um, sort of, this is, this is him sort of sitting out in the uh, middle of the Western landscape. He traveled the country uh, for these uh, nine years, uh, really mapping uh, the Western uh, portions of the United States and what came to be uh, his sort of cloned arid region, um, which you may have seen. Uh, this is a black and white image of a color, a very vibrant color map of uh, watersheds that exist along the Western United States. And his sort of re-understanding of territory at that time from one of political uh, boundaries or ownership boundaries, of which you can slightly see here the outlines of the various states, California, Arizona, so on and so forth, um, and subsequently counties and future counties and other cities and other boundaries uh, and the systems and the resources that move irrespective of those and the processes and the uh, sort of natural ecologies that are occurring uh, that are irrespective of ownership lines or political boundary lines. So I bring this up because as much as we're starting through an understanding of water um, with rising currents, oddly enough, the discussion kind of starts with water uh, here and a kind of a re an understanding of how to vision the landscape um, for fire uh, in that these are latent systems, somewhat invisible systems, if you will, through which um, uh, that are irrespective of, of sort of our understanding of land and ownership uh, that um, if we're really going to kind of grapple with this issue, we need to engage in some way. Um, that leads us to sort of 1910 and really the big burn uh, and or the Great Fire of 1910, where uh, most of Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, Washington State were destroyed. And it really ushered in the contemporary uh, thinking of the uh, sort of federalization or uh, militarization in some respect, quote unquote, of fire suppression. Um, and it, uh, in both in terms of protecting lives and property, um, but also um, <clears throat> really uh, initiated through Teddy Roosevelt in collaboration with John Muir, uh, the conservation movement and the establishment of the national park system <clears throat> through um, the sort of the preservation of land, which is uh, obviously a good thing. Um, this uh, sort of the, the, the taking of wild lands and uh, making them uh, open to all across the country and, uh, and also not allowing development within them. But what two things occurred with that Two one uh, is that uh, through the establishment of the national park system, there's also, it's not as though people weren't living there. Uh, 
And it's not as though there it weren't um, people uh, sort of inextricably tied to these lands. So through the process of the conservation movement, which is generally seen as beneficial, um, many indigenous cultures um, were extricated from their land um, who also had deep knowledge of how to live with these lands. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, sort of gain of public lands came a kind of a loss of an understanding of those lands and a sort of a superimposition of, uh, of lands that were to sort of be maintained and sort of uh, controlled. And in that red sense, in that sense, the, 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 uh, the advent of, of sort of the fire suppression uh, as a methodology and as a sort of largely an ideology in a certain way, um, uh, it started to have greater impacts on the landscape. You can see here, this is an image on the left from uh, Sequoia Kings National Park here in California uh, in 1900, and then the same image in 1995. Uh, on the left, you're seeing a healthy forest, uh, meaning healthy forests are not forests that have contiguous canopies. Healthy forests are really spotty forests, spotty canopies, uh, in that they are affected by fire and other uh, other either natural processes or even uh, uh, sort of controlled or managed logging processes uh, over time. Uh, and as those, as either fire, as fire is suppressed and, uh, and uh, as sort of a healthy maintenance of those forests is uh, sort of uh, either just not paid for or suppressed in some respect, what you see here is a forest in which the canopy grows together which does two things. It, it creates contiguous sort of fuel for fires, but it also deadens the understory uh, of the forest floor and creates uh, sort of conditions for ladder fuels and uh, sort of exacerbates the, the problem. And so as we are looking at this, um, uh, these issues, um, you know, the, how we begin to kind of reimagine the kind of the investment of forest management uh, is critical to, uh, from a larger policy standpoint, kind of engaging this stuff. Um, I bring this up, this is, you know, as part of the, um, the sort of movement of the early part of the 20th century, there's a great propaganda um, sort of campaign through Smokey the Bear. And this is actually a cover of a children's record that was made in the 1950s, I think, 1969, sorry. Um, where you have people like Carol Burnett and Judy Collins and uh, people from Hollywood, uh, all towards uh, talking about um, how fire is uh, dangerous, it's destructive, it's something to be avoided. And of course it is all those things. Um, no one wants to be caught within a wildfire and no one wants their home destroyed. Um, but it is a sort of, a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a characterization of fire um, that is not seen as um, supposed to be part of our human existence um, versus the Native Americans, which really prior to uh, the great fire, the big, the big burn, um, uh, you know, they, there were actually several millions of acres burned every year in California due to Native American burning, which were primarily due to a sort of a land management processes for agriculture. And so they thought of fire as a creative process, as a catalyst for life and growth, as opposed to something to be avoided. Um, obviously, in, in the form of a controlled burn, it's not allowing things to sort of go wild, um, but it's also the understanding that fire is one of the four elements and it is one of those elements through which we exist on the earth and it's something that, if properly utilized, can be actually quite productive. Um, so going into current day, um, if we look at John Wesley Powell's uh, arid regions uh, map, you can see here that line was really, uh, that's the left-hand line, was really his sort of eastern border of arid lands. And that line has now moved 140 miles east um, over the hundred years that he mapped that, uh, uh, he did that mapping. And so this, these are issues that are, we see in California and we see in the West 
primarily, um, but there, 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 there are issues within the United States that are gradually migrating during, through the climate crisis. We are uh, gradually going to see this migration of um, wildfire and drought as, uh, uh, as uh, greater swaths of the country begin to um, experience, um, uh, become impacted by it. Um, and in that, what this, what this talk ultimately wants to get at is how do we begin to develop and how do we as architects and designers, landscape architects, planners, begin to integrate with some of these conditions and these territories and these latent systems that exist within landscapes. So here, what we're looking at is more of a kind of a superimposition of a uh, suburban tract, uh, suburban development over a kind of a territory. And you can see a um, couple things. One, there's a sort of a inherent topography that's been, that's been radically changed, um, but also that there's a sort of a pattern of development that is irrespective of the logic systems below it. You can imagine this sort of stamped out anywhere across most of America. Um, and so as we're thinking through the problem of fire, it's really a, an issue of land planning and land zoning as much as it is individual technologies of building. Uh, wildland urban interface is the greatest, uh, it's the fastest growing land, uh, uh, land use type in the continental United States. This is a map of uh, the US as of 2010. Uh, and uh, that wildland urban interface is really that place where uh, wildlands, meaning places that are primarily uninhabited, not necessarily untouched, but uninhabited by, uh, by humans, um, comes up with, com comes into contact with development. And it's project, it was uh, during the period of 1990 to 2010, so 20 years, only within a 20 year period, uh, almost 13 million new homes were built within the wildland urban interface. And as such, because of that, uh, really that area in the same time period grew by about 33% across the country, which is roughly the size of South Dakota. Um, and it's projected then further that by 2050, uh, another 1 million new homes will be built in the wild. I think, that's, I think that fact has actually increased, has increased. Um, and uh, the expenditure, both in terms of fire suppression costs and insurance claims, uh, uh, either total $2 billion just for 2017 or close to $12 billion just for 2017. Um, so the financial impact of these on uh, federal, state, local municipalities, as well as individuals, is uh, it's, it's the cycle where we, we pay for suppression. We put a lot of money and, uh, uh, and resources uh, into, uh, into a system and a process uh, really which uh, doesn't necessarily solve the problem. It more or less just either, it's not even keeping it in check. Uh, it's, it's kind of an outdated way of thinking through this um, and that the monies could be spent uh, in uh, more effective and holistic ways of thinking towards uh, in, uh, sort of um, uh, integrating or uh, living with wildfire and debris flow. Um, another important or kind of interesting fact is, you know, 94% of uh, the buildings destroyed over roughly a 20 year uh, or 30 year period were built in the same place with the same methods of construction. And I will raise my hand and say, you know, we are rebuilding after the fire. Um, and we are, real, we, are, we are rebuilding in the same place. Uh, and we are not rebuilding the same way we did before with the same method of construction, but um, the, uh, the, uh, the dynamics of, um, uh, of this, uh, of wildfire, the economic component of it and the political component of it really has to do with affordable housing and affordability. Uh, these are uh, images from uh, uh, when Measure S was up on the ballot and uh, for uh, allowing for uh, uh, development of housing within uh, uh, densification within Los Angeles, which was shot down ultimately 
uh, through NIMBYism and people not wanting uh, multifamily housing in their communities or worse yet, quote unquote, affordable housing in their communities. Um, and so as much as this is an environmental issue, uh, it is an, uh, it's an issue of equity and uh, it's a sort of a political and economic uh, issue. I mean, Mike Davis wrote his piece in the Ecology of Fear, uh, his famous piece, uh, The Case for Letting Malibu Burn, you know, which was really a kind of a populist uh, piece sort of taking a stab at the rich, um, you know, those wealthy Malibuites uh, living there and getting bailed out year after year. Um, but really, um, that's not necessarily, uh, that's not really a fair argument if you think about the wild Enderman interface or these conditions uh, more extensively. Most people who live in these regions are either low income or uh, middle income. Uh, and so uh, they, have, they lack infrastructure, lack resources. Uh, and really these are the places where people can afford to be. We are one of those people. We can afford to live there. We can't really afford to live probably in other places of Los Angeles. So um, as much as we um, think through the problem from an environmental standpoint and the environmental impacts of it, um, it's kind of, it, it, there's a feedback loop between development patterns in inner city intensification and how that development either uh, extends or does not extend into territories. Uh, this is an uh, image of, from bringing up Prop 13, which uh, limited, if you don't know this, limited property tax increases uh, back in 1978. And what that did was, although that's great, nobody wants to pay uh, crazy property taxes, what that did was removed a, title, removed a tax base from local communities and local governments, um, which then incentivized more development. Uh, to maintain a tax base. And so as, as much as then, um, you know, as, as again, as much as this is tied into uh, sort of the, the physical conditions and uh, organizational patterns and what have you, I guess the point I'm trying to drive home is that as designers and as a design community, it's not enough to just think through those sort of the organizational and the physical manifestations of these things because they are inextricably political and economic problems. Um, and so incorporating uh, sort of innovative solutions or at least engaging those systems uh, within the thinking is critical to actually coming towards uh, solutions. Um, I'm gonna get into now more of kind of what's in the book, but this is a study now of a section of uh, the Santa Monica Mountains from uh, Malibu. This is Point, uh, uh, sorry, this is Point Doom uh, at the point, and then this extends up past Simi Valley and the 118. Uh, and our home, I don't know if you can see that, this little red dot, that's where our community is. And so these series of maps uh, illustrate, really they're, what they're attempting to illustrate is one, uh, the, the bright red one, that's really the layering of historic fires. And you can see the Wolsey fire outlined in, in white. But that these, the condition of the wildland urban interface is really a kind of a multivalent layered condition of uh, what's noted here, habitat, land use, electrical infrastructure, topography, land ownership, um, infrastructure in the form of roads, and in particular, the, the phenomenon of dead end roads um, and uh, uh, the, the, ne the necessity to sort of re-network um, for uh, issues of egress and retreat and access, um, fire stations, open space, canopy coverage, uh, ecological uh, sort of makeup, um, soil makeup and uh, stream flows and landslides. So it is all to say that these layered conditions, all of these are ways in and ways out of the problem. And is the interrelationship between these through which we can begin to find uh, potential solutions. And so as much as uh, these are just some very preliminary sort of overlaps of more or less diagrams that are intended to be somewhat of narratives in a way to begin to bring up 
it's a relationship between, let's say, canopy coverage and electrical infrastructure in the form of power plants, substations, and electrical lines. Uh, in that, there's a kind of a dialogue that occurs um, between in Southern California, ember driven uh, fires, wind driven fires, uh, and the coastal live oaks that are really a protective uh, 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 sort of system for um, these regions and that coastal live oaks, they're, they're indigenous to fire adapted communities and through their geometry and their uh, sort of leaf makeup, uh, they serve as sort of large umbrellas to protect against uh, ember storms. Um, and then looking at the, the uh, relationship between debris flow and water quality, um, sort of the polluting of uh, reservoirs, streams, and the ocean due to debris flow and the dynamic between that. Uh, and then uh, obviously open space road systems and fire stations and looking at that kind of issues of access and areas of refuge and retreat. Um, this is this is sort of where it takes more <clears throat> a kind of a turn into the projective. So uh, this is you all might know Allison Krauss's diagram uh, for sculpture in the expanded field. It's a very famous diagram and redone multiple multiple times, reframed multiple times. But this is kind of my reframing of it, um, where. Uh, you look at uh, ways in which dis disciplinarily, how can we begin to engage the subject matter and what could be the sort of the fallout from that in terms of strategies. So as we look at infrastructure, landscape, uh, infrastructure and non-infrastructure, meaning infrastructure is a physical entity, a kind of an armature and non-infrastructure, meaning a kind of a practice policy. Um, and then landscape as surface and non-landscape as architecture and then the byproducts of those. So if you take infrastructure and non-infrastructure, you know, you begin to project into what maybe community networks, you take non-infrastructure practice and policy and combine it with not, not landscape or architecture, you get land use and zoning and so on and so forth. Uh, performative surfaces, constructed grounds, and then the sub, uh, sub of those, which is programmatic scaffolds potentially in, uh, and land stewardship. And then the lower, the smaller, uh, uh, either fire adapted communities, right of way washes, those are uh, in, in intended to be kind of solutions that emerge between these different categories, which we'll talk about uh, further in the lecture. So this is just an initial take to try and figure out from a disciplinary standpoint, how we can begin to reframe the issue uh, and understand it in those, in our kind of terms and the ways that we engage this work. Um, so this is the body of the lecture, which we're going to go through four categories, clouds, transects, fields, and blankets. Um, and these are really intended to, again, this, this is a cycle of fire, flood, and debris flow. And so what, it, uh, what I'm trying to do here is actually recategorize the material into qualitative uh, terms. Uh, and so sort of finding correlations between things that might seem otherwise sort of disparate from each other or disconnected from each other and uh, sort of make new uh, relationships between them or find relationships between them in some way. So the first one would be clouds. You all know what a cloud is. Um, but the reason for bringing up clouds is really to say, is really to kind of engage the atmospheric or the environmental uh, of, uh, of fire and debris flow. And so as we talked about earlier with air quality and uh, wildfire smoke um, uh, in the way that it begins to shape environments, uh, fires also create their own environments. This is something that I recently learned about called the fire NATO, which is just like the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life, which is um, you know, essentially they create their own, we all know fires create their own wind dynamics, um, but here what you're seeing is the wind dynamics actually uh, sort of cauterizing into a, uh, a tornado formation that then actually brings flames up through it. Um, pyrocumulus clouds, et cetera, are also examples of that in which, um, oops, in which fires actually generate the environments that then exacerbate on fire. So pyrocumulus clouds are those 
uh, clouds that are formed, not necessarily wildfire smoke, but they're actual clouds that are formed that form lightning storms, and then the lightning form storms potentially then form, uh, generate more wildfire. Um, here, what we're looking at are more or less pages from the book. So here in the upper left is uh, our, uh, our dust clouds uh, from debris flows in the sand, uh, or just debris in general in the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, you might already know this, um, but the San Gabriel Mountains are actually the most active mountain range, at least within the continental United States, if not within the globe. Um, that might be, the latter statement might be a stretch, but definitely within the continental United States. And what that means is that it is constantly shedding debris. You know, John McPhee's Control of Nature, the famous book, um, really talks about the San Gabriels quite extensively. And is it, and so the, the idea that it's constantly under change, it is constantly shifting its topography, it is constantly shedding itself, uh, creates a series of dust clouds um, that, uh, uh, especially around Pacoima, uh, most notably, uh, you know, really inhibit air quality for those residents. Uh, going, to the, going to the lower images, you know, the artificial clouds of fire retardant, um, fire retardant drops, and the sort of the chemical, um, sort of, uh, uh, the sort of chemical distribution of either water uh, or fire retardant across landscapes um, and their subsequent sort of dropping on homes or uh, uh, various habitats or ecologies and the ways that that really destroys habitat. Uh, and as much as it's a preventative measure to create fire breaks uh, within, within a wildfire, it actually inhibits uh, or destroys uh, natural ecologies uh, at the same time. So there's just this interesting correlation between protection and destruction or uh, protection and the, uh, the fallout from that in the, uh, in the impact on, uh, on native habitat, which is a sort of something that we'll keep coming back to. Uh, and then in the upper right is really those technologies and those infrastructures that measure weather, monitor, weather monitors, weather stations, and then those things such as, uh, you know, on construction sites where you're trying to dampen uh, soil, I mean, dampen uh, 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 dust, uh, from construction debris or construction activity, um, again, we have a practice of trying to condition these environments in some way and measure these environments and measure humidity. Uh, wildfires really occur when the Santa Ana's come in, at least in California, in Los Angeles in particular, when those Santa Ana's come in, the humidity level will drop within a period of an hour from whatever it might normally be, 10%, 12% to zero. Um, and those create these kind of perfect storms uh, uh, and that's usually when you'll see most wildfires occur. So in some speculations now, so these, these sections start with some things that are kind of currently happening um, that have some correlation between each other. And then there's a series of speculations that follow. So this is, and some of these are, these are intended more to foster discussion um, than to sort of promote like, hey, that's a perfect solution. Um, so this idea of maybe urban humidification, uh, again, dealing with this idea of humidity, how do we begin to engineer a kind of an environment? Can we begin to think of sort of engineering a sort of a more humid climate uh, through a kind of a distribution, a kind of a field of uh, sort of water cannons or what have you, mist cannons? Uh, the other is uh, pink rain which is looking at the marrying up of fire retardant and electrical infrastructure uh, and uh, finding ways in which the solution and the problem are sort of combined together, uh, creating, because uh, electrical lines are usually the primary point of uh, fire generation here in Los Angeles through uh, down power lines, uh, 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 defective transformers and the like and ways in which we could begin to think through uh, uh, those being uh, taken care of right at the point of the source of the problem. Uh, the next is transects. You, know, you might know what a transect is. A transect is a landscape term. It's a measuring device uh, across a landscape. So it's, you more or less take a line or a zone and stretch it across 
some period of a landscape, and then it's a measuring device through which you can understand that territory through the localized conditions of that, whatever within that, uh, that more defined zone. Uh, and they have a very specific kind of geometry to them, uh, typically, um, which takes the form of these kind of lines through, uh, um, through an environment. So here in the upper left, you're looking at fire breaks, um, really where you clear cut through a forest. Um, these are for fuel driven fires, uh, where you're more or less creating a break between this side of the forest and the other side of the forest. Um, and, the, and the spatial uh, sort of uh, ramifications that has and physical ramifications that has on the landscape, both in terms of its preventative nature um, for wildfire, but also uh, in the way that it disrupts uh, either wildlife corridors or habitat corridors or what have you, but it also creates new corridors. Um, for potential open space or what have you. Uh, Santa Ana winds, the sort of the vectors of Santa Ana winds creating ember whip driven fires here in Los Angeles. Uh, and ember driven fires, and I put these two together because fuel, fly, wildfire is not just wildfire. Um, there are fuel driven fires and there are wind driven fires. So Northern California feel, sees more fuel driven fires. Uh, Southern California sees more wind driven fires in that these are ember uh, wildfires are propagated through ember. Uh, and so what that does is fire breaks don't really work in ember driven fires. You can see, you can think of freeways as large fire breaks, right? Um, but what we see in LA is that uh, the Santa Ana winds will carry embers the size of soccer balls, you know, miles, right? They, you can see embers moving for a mile. And so what you end up getting in wind-driven fires, it's not a continuous kind of wall of fire that moves through, but really a series of spotty fires that happen that propagate across the landscape, and it's very difficult to fight um, and control. And so as we think through the problem of wildfire in Southern California, it's not necessarily the same kinds of uh, solutions that you might think of in Northern California. Um, in the upper right, transects of debris flows, and this is a map of Montecito, uh, and the lines of debris flow that happen through the city fabric, uh, and that, you know, mountain, the mountains and the ocean are intended to be connected together. Uh, the resedimentization of the beachfront, of rivers, of washes, happens through the kind of the shedding of material, the ge geological processes, from the mountains to the water. And as we develop in those areas between the water and the mountains, we are uh, sort of sitting within that natural processes. Uh, and so um, as we begin to think, and there's some subsequent studies of this coming, how do we begin to think through development in these kinds of areas uh, and what kinds of uh, infrastructures or zoning patterns, uh, organizational systems can we begin to uh, imagine that are more in line with the, the natural dynamics or the ways in which the landscape wants to work. Um, and then below that are these sort of these transects with these lines of roads and the issues of access uh, through mountainous terrain um, and uh, thinking through uh, the overlay of infrastructure, uh, access infrastructure uh, and, uh, and topography and ways in which that uh, is either disconnected or reconnected through, and what does that say towards being married to issues of, let's say, stormwater or habitat um, or, uh, or exit, uh, egress and retreat or uh, areas of refuge, et cetera. So this is one study, uh, protection producers, um, which looks at uh, sort of th rethinking land use adjacent to, uh, uh, well, land use that might, uh, uh, land use that might be uh, emerge uh, as people might either move out of a particular area or two, as um, conditions, uh, 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 it's a way of remediating uh, uh, sort of soil conditions or uh, ecological conditions within a certain region. So here, what we're looking at is adjacent, this is along the 101, uh, Santa Monica Mountains are to the left, uh, uh, areas of uh, 
Agora Hills and Thousand Oaks are to the right. Uh, and so uh, what this was saying is to take urban organic waste uh, to essentially to create compost, uh, to sort of recondition the soil adjacent to uh, uh, adjacent to these communities and uh, adjacent to these wildlands that do two things. One, it creates a soil condition. Usually during fires, the soils are destroyed. Um, uh, the nutrients are destroyed. Uh, the soil composition is more or less destroyed, um, especially with the frequency of fire that we see currently. Um, and so this is a way of, of thinking through a remediation of that soil in that uh, through things like either urban organic waste or biochar, uh, the soils actually retain moisture for a greater amount of time. Uh, and as such, create a kind of a break for fire or a preventative measure for the spread of fire. Um, agriculture is a great way to think through that problem in that it's typically a more moist environment um, than a typical landscape might be, especially here in the Santa Monica Mountains. And the byproduct of that being adjacent to communities in either food, uh, sort of food poor areas um, or uh, areas where you can begin to set up community gardens or a kind of an extension of the systems, the economic systems that exist out in Oxnard um, or what have you and sort of revitalize uh, maybe the sort of ag agrarian or agricultural uh, uh, kind of history of Los Angeles um, in some way that is also married with a kind of a resilient uh, strategy for wildfire. Uh, the next is right-of-way washes, which is, uh, again, looking at this issue of the brief flow and back to that image of Monrovia, uh, where the streets are more or less channelized with debris. This is looking at potentially um, uh, redistributing that debris from the debris basins down uh, uh, certain uh, rethinking of the kind of down certain uh, avenues or boulevards within the city, uh, and an understanding that uh, sort of a reimagining of, of the uh, transportation infrastructure in Los Angeles to be married with ones of stormwater and debris flow and habitat and open space uh, that create a kind of another uh, uh, sort of a resilient network dealing with uh, issues of. Uh, debris flow in these in these communities, and as such, kind of reframing or reorienting the city fabric in a in a certain way that's not just um, defensive um, or resilient, but it's resilient in the sense that it also uh, creates a more sustainable uh, set of community uh, uh, set of uh, environments for communities adjacent to it. Um, debris sheds. Debris sheds, you all know what a watershed is. Well, this is a debris shed, thinking through issues of debris, thinking through debris sheds, where um, it's a kind of a rezoning of those areas, much like we saw the lines coming through Montecito, rethinking development patterns and zoning patterns in relationship to the natural processes that are happening within that landscape. So as opposed to a superimposition of a grid, um, it's the inflection of development around uh, the dynamics of, in this case, debris flow um, and a reconnection of the mountains with the water. So here it's somewhat self-evident uh, in that uh, it's kind of, you know, where the debris uh, would come through is, you know, a no build zone, but that opens it up for public open space um, and habitat corridors, uh, corridors and the like. And then there's a kind of a gradation of development and development patterns as you move away from that uh, uh, that are uh, sort of looser and then become more dense as you would uh, move away. But this idea of uh, shifting uh, our understanding of uh, organizational patterns and development patterns and land type, land use um, through the processes of debris was something that I found kind of interesting. And this sort of adds up to um, you know, uh, maybe a, there's a way through these kind of processes, especially through transects, uh, we can begin to, I know Jeffrey, you're very interested in this uh, as well, uh, you know, uh, Olmsted Bartholomew's plan for Los Angeles, uh, the sort of the net of open space networks that evolve across the city 
And can you begin to think through a kind of a marrying of this, these sort of resilience, resiliency strategies or adaptation strategies with the kind of a larger impact of that across the city as a whole um, and a kind of a reframing of uh, the city in relationship to its open space um, through a kind of a, a, a mindset of uh, thinking through wildfire and debris flow. Uh, the last is fields, or second to the last is fields. Um, and this, you all know what a field is. Um, but this talks about things that are distributed across the landscape. And so uh, either electrical infrastructure uh, in the form of electrical towers, um, but here spreading fields, you might not know what a spreading field is or a spreading ground. Uh, these are the spreading grounds of spreading fields of Pacoima again. And what they are is, so the processes of debris basins and the flood control district of Los Angeles has these series of basins, which you can see here in the lower left-hand image. Uh, these are all the profiles of the debris basins along the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, and they total approximately uh, uh, 950 acres, um, which is roughly the size of Central Park. Uh, it's actually two and a half Central Parks, I think, um, in terms of potential open space. Uh, and as the process of debris basins is that debris comes down, debris basins are like big bathtubs uh, that collect debris at the end of these ravines. And there's a there's a there's an enormous amount of money and uh, um, physical uh, expenditure in cleaning those out. So they clean them out. They big, bring big trucks into them, clean out all the debris, bring that debris to what's called spreading fields or spreading grounds, which is what you're looking at here. And you can see the scale of them in relationship to the freeway. So this is the 210 uh, right here. And these are the spreading fields of Pacoima. And so they bring that debris to these grounds and it allows the water, that soil is, you can imagine, that debris is quite saturated from water, with water. And that water is allowed to infiltrate down into the aquifers. And then you take the, the, the debris and you bring it out, you truck it out to uh, landfills. And so there's a, there's a constant process of cleaning and uh, uh, sort of cleaning out the debris basins, trucking them to spreading grounds, trucking them to landfills. Uh, and that cycle, the carbon footprint of that, you can imagine, is enormous. You could also imagine that the environmental impact of that on these communities is enormous. Uh, but there's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a process that kind of goes invisible within Los Angeles and is, um, one in which we, as we can begin to rethink, maybe through, rethink debris basins and rethink uh, the flood control system in Los Angeles, it allows us to potentially open up uh, these territories for other kinds of things. So the first of the field speculations is really riffing off of the electrical uh, infrastructure. And this is something that's somewhat known already, this idea of microgrids, um, where, uh, you know, electrical, the issue of electricity um, in Los Angeles is a really fraught one. One and resources in Los Angeles is really a fraught one, where we, you know, we bring in water from uh, um, from the Colorado River in huge distances. We bring in our electricity from uh, across vast landscapes, and uh, um, so we have these sort of umbilical cords kind of out to other portions of the country to feed Los Angeles. And so not only does that create a wildfire issue in that you have these, uh, this infrastructure kind of crossing across these lands that are then windswept by Santa Ana winds, but it's a huge equity issue um, in that as recently if, as you've uh, maybe as experienced or heard about the blackouts that have occurred, uh, the rolling blackouts that have occurred uh, to, to prevent wildfire um, are, uh, disproportionately impact lower income communities um, and uh, communities without means, uh, without infrastructure. Um, and so um, as much as, uh, uh, you know, other communities might have the ab availability to have generators at their home or what have you, you have people going out without power for uh, sometimes hours or days at a time. And so the microgrid is really a, 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 a uh, an idea about creating self-containing self, self -containing, uh, kind of more localized power structures within 
the city that are um, could be tied to each other, but are really allowed to kind of come off grid from the main electrical system. And there's a new grant program that was just uh, initiated at the end of last year, or with, yeah, I think it was the, just the end of last year, the beginning of this year, um, where I believe it's 1.5 billion, something like that, that's been allocated to be a subsidy um, for lower income people to purchase solar panels, uh, uh, battery backups and uh, generators for their homes to become self-sufficient during blackout periods or just to become, just, uh, just to allow them to come off the grid. So sort of the rethinking of, uh, I'm not sure, that there's not really a solution posited here in terms of the impacts of that on the urban fabric uh, or on our understanding of development uh, organizational patterns. Um, but uh, the, the sort of the thinking through a kind of a, uh, a autonomous kind of distributed system um, as opposed to uh, an independent kind of distributed system as opposed to um, the typical way of thinking through infrastructure as kind of a hierarchical system, um, I think is quite compelling and has kind of a rich potential um, for rethinking through these things. Uh, the next is microbasins. So microbasins, um, uh, as the pre basins are these large uh, kind of vessels, as I described earlier, that sit at the, right at the base of the mountains. Um, but what they do is, uh, you know, debris flow and uh, landslides really happen, much like you see a snowball rolling down a hill. Little debris picks up some momentum, it picks up more debris, it picks up more speed, and it just keeps rolling down a hill. And by the time it hits the bottom, it has quite a great degree of, of material and velocity um, that when it hits the debris basin, um, uh, if, if those debates, if those basins are not maintained properly, of which they are not, they're all hitting their 50 and 60 year lifespan right now. They're at the end of that lifespan. And the debris basins in Montecito, if you saw the photos from the LA Times, um, there were aerial photos showing how they had been, just been completely overgrown and filled in over time because they just weren't maintained because there's not the capital to maintain them. Um, so the thought here is to create think of more of a distributed system um, through these kind of chevrons. So like a up, sort of an upturned V or a downturn V um, that either catch or deflect and slow debris as it goes down the hill. Um, and what that does is two things. One, uh, usually debris flows and uh, those kinds of shedding of material happen on steeper slopes rather than shallower slopes, obviously. So it's a kind of a regrading or sort of a mountain making exercise of sort of micro plateaus um, uh, along the mountainside, which help to stabilize those conditions um, and create places for uh, sort of outposts for, you know, kind of hiking or helicopter pads or habitat or what have you. Um, but they also, more importantly, they open up uh, the area of the debris basins below for, um, for uh, public lands, community, uh, accessible open space, et cetera, um, because all of these basins sit directly adjacent to communities. Um, and so there's potentially that, that 950 acres I was talking about potentially starts to get opened up um, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as accessible to, uh, to people. Um, the last of this group is fuel flocks. And these are kind of like both hard and soft kind of strategies. Um, where, uh, you know, thinking through a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, issues in wildfire is fuel management um, and uh, uh, the maintenance of the management of lands uh, in areas where there's extremely steep terrain, uh, much through the Santa Monica Mountains is inaccessible for most people. And so it's impossible to actually get in there and properly uh, do fuel modification. And so the thought of actually, you know, using herds of goats um, or what have you to begin to think through a processes that uh, one is more is kind of softer um, and and less expensive, but two creates a kind of economy in and of itself um, through which uh, you know this becomes a kind of a business through which people can begin to do this. Um, the last is blankets. 
So the last category of blankets really talks about those things you remember the illustration in the lower right um, from previously. Uh, but those are these are those things that are somewhat uh, irrespective. So blankets, you all know what a blanket is. It's that thing that kind of is irrespective of the stuff that's underneath it. It just is like a cover, right? And sometimes those coverings are visible, and sometimes those coverings are invisible. Um, and so in the upper right, I mean the upper left, are coastal live oaks and uh, the coastal live oaks used to really uh, be quite extensive, or the oaks in general used to be quite extensive across Southern California. Um, they've over time been lost, now they're all protected. Um, but you can see a lot of those in Pasadena. This is an image from Pasadena um, back in the day, and now uh, the famous sort of oaks that sit right in the middle of roads in Pasadena that you have to drive around. Um, uh, but oaks are, as I described earlier, um, that kind of a, a blanket, if you will, in the sense of a kind of a canopy uh, or a sort of a tree, series of tree canopies that um, sort of protect, uh, protect the environment from wildfire, uh, the propagation of wildfire in the, in the fact that they are uh, indigenous to these fire adapted landscapes. Um, the, off to the right is chaparral. You might have all heard this term chaparral. Um, which is really the native landscapes of the Santa Monica Mountains. And chaparral is a sort of dense thicket of vegetation. Um, and it's meant to burn. It's meant to burn every 20 to 30 years. Um, it, and then it regenerates. Um, what happens now, though, is that with, as fires are now not every 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but they're every two years, three years, um, the chaper chaparral doesn't have a chance to regenerate itself. Um, and so what happens is you get a series of invasives that, uh, uh, that take over instead. And uh, from like you see, if you've, drawn, if you've driven through the hills of Calabasas or uh, Santa Monica Mountains or probably other areas as well, I'm trying to remember, where you see the fluorescent hillsides of yellow, these sort of yellow fluorescent hillsides of mustard weed um, that's all, it's extremely beautiful, but it's also all invasive. Um, and compounded with that, uh, the, uh, with the frequency of fire, that too is burned out. And so, um, as I was mentioning earlier with the agricultural bins, a lot of times, and you'll see this, uh, is that the soils are actually completely destroyed in that with the frequency of fire, it doesn't really allow anything to take hold and in that sense, uh, just creates kind of barren land that is then more susceptible to debris flow during rains. Um, the lower left then is this idea of topographic shading, and the uh, the the um, the the sort of phenomenon of microclimates. And the, it's obvious that the south side of a hill might be warmer than the north side of the hill. Um, but in thinking through patterns of development or patterns of occupation um, or, uh, uh, or sort of enhancement of ecologies or ways of understanding the landscape a little bit differently is that the northern sides are always slightly wetter, slightly cooler, um, and promote slightly different kinds of uh, ecological conditions than the north sides do, I mean the south sides do. Um, and so thinking through orientation and topographic shading, I think is a way of beginning to understand the landscape uh, through its kind of physicality, but in combination with its, uh, its environment. So now there's the last three kind of studies. The first one is parametric policies, and this gets into ideas of insurance. And this might, um, the reason, it, and the way it gets in, the reason for getting into insurance is that you know, insurance is one of those things that, you know, designers don't really think about. Um, I certainly never thought about. Um, but it is inextricably tied to issues of wildfire uh, in that, um, you know, a lot of people aren't reinsured. A lot of people are underinsured. Um, and, uh, and so it, 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 it has a feedback loop on um, how people can either rebuild or not and uh, on uh, the ways in which we begin to rethink how we inhabit these places. And so the Nature Conservancy um, 
did a really innovative program. This is kind of a borrowed idea from the Nature Conservancy, which is they took out, uh, they in combination with a series of other entities took out an insurance policy on a coral reef in Mexico. And the, coral, the reason they did that was the coral reef had series of values to it. One had an environmental value. It was protecting the seaside city from uh, uh, sort of uh, either coastal, from coastal erosion and, uh, um, and tidal uh, action during storms. Um, it promoted habitat. Um, so it had an ecological benefit to it. Um, and then that, in addition, had an economic benefit to the city. So it was a great it was a tourist destination. Everybody would go there and see the coral reef. I mean, businesses would sort of flourish off of that. And culturally, the, the city um, was inextricably tied to this idea of the coral reef and the natural environment. So the coral reef was dying. And so the Nature Conservancy, in, a, in combination with a few other parties, took an insurance policy out on it. And the way the insurance policy worked was this by creating a kind of a fund. Um, and that fund, people would pay into the fund and the fund would take care of the coral reef. Um, and so I was trying to think through, well, how would that work for wildfire? Meaning, how do we begin to think through, this gets, this gets back to this idea of community. How do we find a way that um, we could promote localized stewardship of land, um, localized involvement or involvement of local communities and fire adaptive communities and fire safe councils in the management of the land around them. So this takes and in, in a sense help pay for, uh, help sort of, um, what do I want to say, help substantiate them continuing to live within these environments that it's not as though, why am I bailing you out for living in this area? Um, why don't you just move? Um, but if there's a way that we can begin to find uh, that people can be insured through a kind of a stewardship process, um, maybe there's a way we can think through the problem of insurance. So here, this creates a kind of a fund and the made up name is Santa Monica Mountains Wildland Management Trust, which this, with this crazy acronym, um, but really would say Southern California Edison, Agora Hills, this is just for my area, Pepperdine, County of Los Angeles, the city of Malibu, um, uh, Malibu Chamber of Commerce, um, the state of California in general, would, and other maybe local businesses or jurisdictions um, would pay into a fund. And that fund, what it would do is three things. One, it would pay for science, stewardship, restoration, and maintenance that ensures the health of those ecosystems, meaning that there would be active kind of stewardship and uh, a maintaining and a working and a research into these lands that would promote their health and vitality and, uh, and being more resilient to wildfire. Uh, and there's potential partners for that, fire safe councils, local nonprofits, et cetera. Um, B, it would pay the premiums to buy parametric insurance on a designated area of the mountains or community. And what that does, what that means is that parametric insurance is something that pays out super quick. So usually, um, you know, during an event, FEMA, will, to go through FEMA and get the money through FEMA or a lawsuit or what have you will take you years, years and years to get the money. Um, and so what parametric insurance does is it pays out almost immediately. And what that allows you to do is actually rehabilitate a landscape or ecosystem almost immediately after a event. So um, you're not waiting for um, uh, monies to come in but allows you to sort of get right back in and start rehabilitating that area almost immediately. Um, and C, uh, it acts as a kind of a self-insurance um, that when you don't quite hit the threshold of your insurance, it will pay out um, for smaller scale events. So it sounds kind of boring, you know, this idea of insurance, but it's so inextricably tied to maybe how we think about working with and adapting to these kinds of landscapes um, that I think it's important to I think it's really critical we, we think through that. Well, we, begin, we as designers begin to at least understand those issues and understand maybe their impacts on how we rethink these problems. Uh, next to the last is woodland umbrellas, which gets back at this coastal, I mean, this coastal live oak issue. Currently there's about a 6% book coverage um, in Los Angeles, um, about 3.5 oaks per acre 
um, with an average temperature around 92 degrees Fahrenheit during the summer months. Um, uh, and, you know, potentially thinking through a kind of 60% oak cover or 35 oaks per acre um, and reducing the uh, heat island effect and heat gain overall uh, increase in heat on the urban fabric. And uh, other aspects of then becoming a kind of resilient strategy towards wildfire, but also a kind of a greeting, greening of urban fabric um, in, uh, uh, in areas of the city that don't have much vegetation, the dynamic of greening city streets uh, and uh, tree-lined streets. There's this, re this research that's been done that tree-lined streets are kind of have less crime on them than, less that tr than streets that are not tree-lined. Um, and so this notion of sort of the propagation of a kind of a blanket of, uh, of, of, of coastal live oaks or oaks um, or sycamores or what have you um, that uh, also uh, help to enhance air quality, uh, et cetera. The, city. the last one is slope sponges. So these are, um, this is actually built off of this uh, very small technology um, it, the idea came up with a small te technology called seep containers. And seep containers are these little concrete boxes that um, you use to gather water. And then there's a reservoir at the bottom. And then the, the tops of them are usually planted. Um, and so this was thinking through that at a kind of a larger scale of, um, again, back to the idea of water, uh, of how would you begin to gather water off of uh, either uh, uh, either stormwater uh, off of freeways or roads um, uh, or off of within mountainsides or what have you uh, and gather those within reservoirs and actually start to create maybe networks of those that again create open space for people, habitat, a kind of a resilient strategy in terms of wildfire or even debris flow potentially. Um, and uh, um, sort of reshape uh, the, the sort of the land use patterns and uh, uh, on fabric adjacent to these kinds of uh, environments. Um, and that is all to say, uh, just coming back to, this is the last slide, uh, back full circle to the sort of this idea to this, not full circle, but to this idea of community is that a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of what's presented here is, uh, and a lot of what you'll be doing is really to imagine uh, possible futures or poss uh, possibilities that uh, foster discussion and dialogue. Um, and that it's a kind of a, it's a process of dialogue and education um, that really um, uh, is, is really what we, we need right now. Um, we need uh, the design community to begin to engage the science and the, the scientists and the policymakers to begin to envision potential futures, uh, uh, much like the rising currents uh, discussion did, uh, and uh, uh, begin uh, to allow for politicians and local municipalities to think of a way in which we're not uh, working in opposition to these systems, meaning kind of hard infrastructure or sort of rigid systems, but much more softer adaptive systems that allow us to um, um, uh, sort of, um, well, what am I gonna say? Sort of uh, begin to uh, advance or, uh, well, I'll just use the term again, advance uh, or adapt uh, to this changing climate that's uh, gonna be moving on a trajectory for quite some time. Um, the patterns of climate change are not gonna stop on a dime. It's much like a boat that when you shut the engine off, it's just gonna keep coasting. Um, and so even if we were to shut off all uh, uh, carbons emission, carbon emissions, et cetera, today, the climate would keep warming. And so the notion that we have systems that are finite uh, and uh, singular is kind of, is a really a false one and a misnomer. And we really need to think through strategies that are much more adaptive and agile um, to deal with constantly changing and shifting circumstances. And I bring this image only up to say that in our community, a lot of that, uh, you know, uh, we were destroyed and a lot of this has been through an education process of my running an education program with the community to begin to talk through how do we rebuild? How do we begin to reimagine 
uh, our community and this environment in relationship to us living in the Santa Monica Mountains? And how can we begin to set aside our preconceptions of how we might want to live, which harkens to the past, and imagine a kind of another kind of future um, that is a much more sort of symbiosis and uh, holistic with our environment. So I think that's it. I hope that helped. And thank you very much for your time. Greg, thank you. Wow, that was such, so informative and so thoroughly thought and, uh, you know, aligned so much with uh, some of the research initiatives that, that we're aiming to look at. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for, for it. Um, I'm sure um, <clears throat> students will have many questions for you, uh, maybe as a icebreaker, as a way to get the discussion going, um, I'll ask a question or two. Um, uh, from the, the work that you've done, um, uh, you know, um, cities look at the, the climate risks that um, pertain directly to it and, and, um, and thinking about Los Angeles, how, where would you place fire threat relative to other risks that the city faces? Um, and, and, and maybe as a kind of uh, way to make it even, an even lead, more leading question, like how, how do you see it relative to earthquakes? You know, I mean, that's the one thing that we, we I mean, which is not climate risk related, but it's environmentally related and, and, and will have a huge impact. And so, I mean, I, 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 I asked that in terms of um, uh, prioritization, you know, if, if a city only has a, a certain amount of resources, um, how, how much should we be thinking about fire? Well, I think, I mean, um, it's interesting to think of fire in relationship to earthquakes. Uh, Los Angeles has always been known as the city of earthquakes, right? And uh, earthquakes have always been uh, associated with its identity in a very deep way. But wildfire is not really ever, as of recent it has, but not historically. Um, but I would say that wildfire is that thing that we, we can't predict when an earthquake is going to hit. And we can do things like seismo, seismically retrofit buildings and things of that sort uh, to prevent, to protect our building fabric. But um, I think from in terms of wildfire, uh, my personal opinion is it's more important than earthquake in that it, um, uh, it is something that we can, uh, it, it's affected by and it affects a broader, uh, a broader range of issues across our uh, across the city, meaning it touches on, it engages issues of land use, it engages issues of infrastructure, uh, it engages technologies of building, um, it engages issues of habitat and ecosystems and the balance between those, um, and uh, and it. It, it, it's something through which we can, much like I would say, sea level rise and the imagining of sea level rise scenarios uh, across the East Coast and Europe, et cetera. Um, it's, it's something through which um, we can uh, begin to rethink a future of Los Angeles that is uh, tied, uh, uh, that shapes the city that is tied to it's kind of it's uh, uh, it's kind of endemic properties, if you will. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if I'm answering. Absolutely. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I I think it's. I mean, the, the word important is kind of a. It's a hard one, but I think there's there's more. Uh, I, we're seeing that it has more and more impact than earthquakes do. Um, it has much more destructive force and capital cost and capital expenditure across the state than earthquakes do. Um, and it's also that place where I think we can have the most impact on sort of rethinking our built environment rather than, uh, I think earthquakes are kind of hard. I maybe I haven't thought about it enough, but it feels kind of hard to imagine. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, exactly. yeah. Like like really, it, it, sound, it seems like, uh, 
you know, for all cities, there's a, a critical climate risk issue to address and that, that um, suddenly it's become clear for Los Angeles that it's fire, that maybe it wasn't so clear even five years ago. Um, but what we've seen in terms of the acceleration of climate change, that it's become something that is now forefront. Yeah, and and I mean I think it's really interesting what you say that that um, it when one begins to think about fire that we see in so many ways the its connection to the assumptions that we've made about living in Los Angeles and how through the lens of fire that it enables us to both you know think of solutions but also rethink things that are inefficient or unoptimized in terms of the way the city operates. So, so I think in that way, the micro grid was really interesting that um, as a solution to t types of fires that are specific to Southern California, that um, it, it proposes a, a, a way to reduce the threat of fire, but it also enables us to think about our energy usage and our energy distribution and production uh, in a productive way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's the, that's ultimately, the goal is that the problem in the, in the problem is inextricably the solution in some way. And um, I, I think LA and well, most cities in general, but, uh, LA in particular has grown and developed um, more or less in opposition to its environment and to its uh, uh, access to resources and all of those kinds of things, right? So uh, it, um, it it's a prime candidate for beginning to think through uh, strategies that are that just sort of trying to flip that on its head and, and are more holistic and connected with the, with the situation in which we find ourselves, which has been primarily ignored for a long time. Again, I think the difference between, not to keep bringing this back to water and sea level rise, but I do think that it, there is a difference in that, um, in that, as I was saying earlier, you know, wildfires have existed here for centuries and millennia, and it's not something new. Now we're seeing them more frequent, for sure, but it's not a new condition as let's say sea level rise is, which is a new phenomenon based on, that's being generated through the climate crisis. But here, it's something I think we've more or less ignored and we're seeing it exacerbated not only through climate change, but through the decades of, I mean, we're seeing now the, the, the court, the uh, the, the conflict, it's all sort of come together in one big conflict as we've been developing in these areas for years and years and years. Um, we've had some fires here and there, but now as we've seen the uprise in the, with the climate, uh, uh, climate change, all that development is now uh, right in the line of fire, if you will, not to use a pun, but um, and so I think that's why we're, it's becoming more and more on the minds of people that it's just affecting built fabric so much. And it's, and it's illustrating to everyone how much we failed in our understanding of living in this region. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I think that. So um, I don't know, it's an interesting phenomenon. And I think that the, the tendency is to say, get out and I, I i do think there's a sort of a there there is a difference in the approaches towards fire uh and the mentality towards fire than there is towards the mentality towards discussions around sea level rise and i, br I always keep bringing those together because i do think that becomes a platform through which to jump because there's so much work that's been done on it over the years but the psychology around fire is uh, completely different. There's a kind of romanticization of living with water, right? Like I'm going to live with water and I'm the, uh, the canals of Venice and what have you, um, which fire doesn't have that correlation to it. And it has the psychology of uh, 
as I was describing earlier, I mean, it is dangerous, um, but we've been grown up to suppress it at any cost. And, uh, and I think it's gonna take a lot to get around that mentality of thinking through fire in a, in a different way, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that is seen as, a, as, as, as part of our environment as much as you know, rain is or as much as uh, uh, you know, blizzards are or you know, whatever. You know, yeah, yeah. Those things that we, it's just one of those things we need to uh, accept as part of our environment. And I think that's where, however, I think it, it, there's a need for action to, um, urgent action, I think, to uh, begin to grapple with this, this notion of, um, you know, do you allow, I think if there's a kind of a right territory, do, do you allow people to rebuild where there were fires? And um, I think for us that that can be the opening to a kind of a dialogue of us as design professionals being able to reimagine potential futures that um, that maybe start to answer that question in a way that that's why I bring up the issues of insurance and other things yeah. that uh, that don't automatically kick people into the responsive or just get out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think the the initial reaction, especially for people who don't have any investment in a community is, oh, that's ridiculous. Like that, right. there's no reason why anyone should build there. And, you know, I, I think, it, could you talk a little bit more about the, the um, what you think are the key points and key takeaways in the discussion of rebuild versus not rebuild? Because, I, you know, one, one in, in the work that you've done in, uh, in insurance um, studies and in working with the communities, I mean, one argument that can be made is that it's only through people who have a direct investment and interest in a place that solutions will arise um, that, that, that could be effective and productive for that area. Um, whereas a uh, um, retreat um, is attractive because it's, uh, you know, it, it seems like a, a quick solution, but it, it also, um, you know, I, I, I don't mean this glibly, but it leaves, maybe it leaves too much on the table and maybe it, it's a policy solution that looks attractive, but there's also a huge economic impact of doing that. So I don't know if you could talk about what you've learned, what you think are, are things that maybe people haven't thought about um, in, in terms of the question of beat, um, rebuild versus retreat. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, I mean, that's really the, that's the, that's the main question on the table. Uh, I, what do I think about that? I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'll take my community, for example, as an example. Um, there are, uh, uh, there's folks who don't want to rebuild and leave. There's folks who want to stay. Um, and there's folks who want to stay but can't afford to stay. So there's these kind of tiers of uh, uh, of the issue that are kind of complex. Um, and as the the whole idea of managed retreat or retreat in general, I think there's a couple things about that. One retreat immediately has kind of bad connotations to it, meaning you could say. Uh, um, everybody get out. Either we're going to have eminent domain over your land uh, or we're going to buy your land, either one, um, both of which seem unfeasible. Uh, but there's another idea about, quote, retreat that I think is less about, uh, less a kind of the negative connotations of that and more about um, I think retreat's the wrong word, a kind of a reframing of how we think through the landscape. So that, again, I think these are opportunities to, instead of saying um, everyone out, 
how do we begin to kind of reconsider how we reuse that land or use that land either for people to live there or for other means. It's not as though the land's not valuable and it's not as though people can't still live there. It's just a, a change in the mindset of how you do it. And I think the retreat is kind of a retreat from uh, previous ways of thinking. I think there's a value in, I don't know, it's a very complicated answer. I'm kind of staggering around with it a little bit because um, I'm fully of the belief as a designer and as a person who wants to imagine a new future that we can uh, think of new ways of uh, building in these areas and developing in these areas. I'm a fervent believer in that. I also know that what that's going to take is a, um, is a, uh, is a rethinking of what property one, what property ownership might mean, um, or uh, how, what, how municipalities actually um, think about development in their areas uh, that might be necessarily less dense, or they're dense in different kinds of ways um, that, they, uh, that they might need to, uh, let's say Malibu, for example, this is just on my mind because that's where I live, uh, that there's, a, there's an idea of maintaining a certain quality of life and a certain condition of life that is not, um, not possible anymore if you don't have the means to rebuild in a certain kind of way. And so I think it's gonna take, I'm not answering your question because it's a tough question that I haven't got my head around yet. Um, Sorry. No, no. I, I, I mean, I, I think what it, it reveals is just how how dynamic the situation is, and and uh, you know that there are so many different stakeholders involved, and it, it's it's not something that's going to be easily uh, resolved. And and I mean, I, I only ask because it's something that that we've only started to begin to think about, and and uh, you know similarly can feel that there's so many different directions it could take that uh, um, that it, uh, it, it's one we want to we want to challenge ourselves to address because of this fact. Yeah, I think I mean a lot of the issue comes around uh, there's this a, a lot of the ways in which these this, this is discussed is um, if you're going to rebuild in a certain area, hey, here's what defensible space is and here's what home hardening is right? And defensible space is that thing through which you uh, sort of maintain your property in radiance, kind of those radial uh, sort of series of circumference, uh, uh, series of uh, sort of zones that uh, come off of your property from five feet to 30 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet, et cetera, et cetera. And that all sounds well and good. And that's what everybody promotes in terms of if you're going to rebuild, if you're going to reconstitute yourselves within these environments. Here's what you need to do. You need to build in a certain way with home hardened materials and you need to manage your landscape. Um, the difficulty with that, and that's why there's sort of a difficulty in this, there's a sort of politicization of this whole thing um, in that individual homeowners are and individual municipalities are uh, in a kind of a rethinking of how you might rebuild your own home or rethink how you might organize your city are in direct, let's say, conflict with, let's say, the Coastal Commission or statewide agencies who are uh, managing protected habitat. And so there's a, there's a relationship between protected habitat and native ecologies and development patterns and what it takes me to protect my home and build in a certain way. And at the same time, those that say the, those, that defensible space kind of thing is always usually in a complete overlap with a protected condition. And so I am both in the situation of I can't protect myself because I'm protecting a habitat that's adjacent to me. So there's these, there's these conflicts that exist within these environments that I think that's where it starts to be made a little sticky is that um, and that's where I that's where I think there 
you know, it's not an architectural solution and it's not a landscape solution and it's not a planning solution. It's, it's a different kind of a solution that really hybridizes those and thinks through correlations between different systems simultaneously and how they can all kind of coexist in a way that is both protecting and maintaining and rethinking and reimagining at the same time. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I, as we, there's a project I'm doing currently with the Santa Monica Mountains that is about this. We creating a whole website about defensible space and all these things you guys have seen before. And, um, but we're going to do in a slightly different way. It's about sustainable fire wise practices. But the reason I bring that up is my client is actually a committee of 15 agencies. And those 15 agencies are, you know, Cal Fire, Theater Pain Association, California Wildlife, uh, the Santa Monica Mountains Trust, uh, and so on and so forth, that all have competing interests and all have competing agendas through which you're trying to navigate uh, uh, ways of kind of rethinking and, 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 and reframing these areas, right? So mm -hmm. it's not just either, and it's also then jurisdictional in terms of city agencies and all the other things that we know of normally, but there's a whole other series of overlaid interests that are both locally, that are both local, city, and statewide that, um, that are impacting our rethinking of that. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I've, I've been aware of the complexity of the built environment for a very long time, but it, it's even uh, challenged my understanding of the complexity of the built environment <laughs> for that. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so as we think through these issues, I'm just trying to come back to this idea of retreat versus rebuilding is that, um, you know, it is, it, is, it is fraught within a kind of a net of, uh, of political, economic, cultural, and per, like per, literally personal uh, motivations that is not um, not so simplistic. It, just put it that way. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and, it, and I just, I only say that because the tendency is, and I have this tendency, and, uh, and uh, the tendency is that I'm going to make some big moves and I'm going to create some sort of large scale thinking here. And it's that there's, there, there needs to be this uh, a really under, a real deep understanding of the complexity of the net and moving between a variety of scales to really come at solutions that are, um, that are sort of deep structured and resilient. Right, okay. Right. Um, okay. Um, I'm anyway. sure, yeah, I'm sure uh, there are many questions. So I will uh, leave it to you guys to initiate. Do you guys want to go ahead? Hi, just let me say hello to Greg. Hey, Hitoshi, how are you? Hey, Hitoshi, I didn't see you. You didn't come up on my screen. How are you? <laughs> Fine. Hi, Hitoshi. Thank, uh, thank you for doing this for us. And, uh, you know, this is a part of this big initiative called RTL3. And uh, your actually a lecture will be shared among all these 11 university participating, if it's okay. Of course, yes. Since yeah. I guess the David is recording, I think you said okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've already clicked okay. Yeah. The one question I have actually is that, you know, when there's a tsunami, right, destroy the tons of houses like in Japan, and there's an issue also, right, the relocations or rebuilding the community. Right, but that in that case, actually the government steps in, and then actually set up sort of a bigger strategy to make sure maybe the risk is a little lower and the resiliency is increased. And it happens because actually this disaster, supposed to be the one ten years ago, especially supposed to be the disaster happens once in 1,000 year, right? And then there's another smaller one maybe happens uh, every 50 years and then they, they kind of 
create the environment against it. And in the case of fire, the story is a bit different, but I'm just curious, right? There are lots of people and the community are suffering. And I wonder when actually people decide, right? And you mentioned that there are people who can't afford to stay or have decided to leave. And is there any sort of a, uh, more like a collective, I mean, or governmental sort of effort to kind of a, help to rebuild sort of a safer community or it doesn't exist it's completely relying on the resident we zero eyes on the resident yeah ah so there's that not, yeah there's no larger I, i'll just speak let's say after woolsey or you could even say after paradise uh -huh. i mean the paradise is a great example of a whole city that was wiped out and um, I mean, you've actually had architects come in and help these city try the people try and replan their cities, but the state's not coming in to help rebuild that. No, no. it's all so private. Yeah. Any improvement in terms of infrastructural sort of uh, uh, let's say the the DASA risk reduction? Nothing. No. Wow. I mean, discussions at local levels of, let's say, Malibu or other places will talk about, okay, here's how we're going to prepare for the next fire, or here's how we're going to, uh, you know, talk about evacuation routes and things like that. But in terms of a, a, a rehabilitation from a, from a productive sense of creating something out of this in terms of helping people out, mm-mm. What about then uh, within the community? Yeah. Within the community, is there? I mean, I know that you know this kind of things weaken the community, but is there any sort of collective effort of the community to do something together to maybe to make the sort of a, a reconstruction easier in terms of you know like a setting up some kind of a collective strategy or anything? I'm sure I'm asking probably question that I know the answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I would say there's a couple things. I mean, a lot of the issues in, when you say community, yeah, it's a different, right? There's a different understanding of community right. in right. America maybe than in Japan. Right. Um, so there's that, there's a cultural shift here in America. <laughs> But um, I will say that what does emerge in fire prone areas are what's called either fire adapted communities or fire safe councils. And those two things are um, kind of grassroots, if you will, uh, organizations that formulate around, uh, they kind of self organize and formulate around a particular locale. And, uh, Northern, Northern Topanga, North, Northern Topanga Canyon Fire Safe Council is actually one of the preeminent fire safe councils in probably the Americas for sure, not mm -hmm. just California. And uh, what they've done and what we're going to try and do with our community, and these are, so North Topanga are a series of single family properties, single property owners. And they have created a council that uh, a kind of a loose district, if you will, uh, through which this council, um, they, they monitor and they educate and they uh, look at people, how, how are people building, they help people out with how to rebuild, they look at, um, uh, shared new shared infrastructures that could come about in the community, but that's across, that's distributed across um, public, you know, uh, public right of ways and public lands. Right, so it, it it's individual, it's it's public streets and, um, uh, but individual property owners. So there's, I think they have some interface with, uh, with the county in that regard as they try and rethink through things, but it's not a county initiative thing, it's a locally initiated thing. 
Um, similarly with, let's say our community, which actually is private. So we have a private community and um, we are trying to think through ways of rebuilding. And I think after the disaster, it's a very, it's a difficult thing um, in that people just uh, scatter, right? And so there's a kind of a way, there's a way in which like our community of 100, well, 215 homes, uh, you had people you know, as far as Northern California and as far as, you know, down towards San Diego who had fled, right? They just said, we're getting out of here. We have nowhere else to go. We're going to go stay with relatives or whatever they're going to do. And so the reconstitution of the community to try and help people is hard because people are just not present and distributed. Right. And I think that's a dynamic of the disasters that right. if you don't have the federal government or some larger entity coming in and helping people to give temporary housing or restructure it in some way, it's left up to individuals that even with a community organization or a community structure like we have, it's difficult to assemble uh, assistance to. And FEMA's kind of broken. So nice. that's that FEMA's, I think FEMA is seen as maybe that entity in the United States. Um, but, and I think they probably do a decent job with um, uh, hurricane, tornado, uh -huh. kinds of things. Well, they're bringing trailers, and you have, you know, so essentially trailer cities to get people rehoused in some way. Um, but for wildfire, it doesn't. I haven't seen that in any event happen. Um, it's more in the form of monies to help with staying in a hotel or nice. those kinds of issues. I think that did that answer your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it just. Uh... It's amazing also that the fire is treated differently from the uh, other disasters somehow. And I'm always thinking about why is it, why it is more treated as a traffic accident type thing rather than the uh, water level rising. And why? Because it should be treated in the same way. And I'm kind of curious also. But also the yeah. community is a key word, but the also the, the, like you said, the community has a really different meaning depending on where you are and, you know, so. Yeah. I have to let the uh, student ask a question. I think Thomas is waiting. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, I should not help by you much, okay? So let, let him ask, you know, ask a question, right, Thomas? Yeah, I, I actually had uh, some of the same questions as you, Hitoshi, but also maybe uh, to extend on this uh, idea of how community is constituted in areas of affected by Woolsey fire. Um, I'm imagining that in 2018, a lot of changes in uh, fires became recognized as natural disasters and FEMA came into play uh in response in a much different way uh, i read about community emergency response teams organized by fema as a one uh, seemingly novel way to prepare communities uh, and as well about measure hh in santa monica mountains that is on the ballot this year could you speak to those uh, ways that the community is responding and what they represent in this landscape? Um, what the role of communities are in these landscapes? I mean, I think that, I mean, you mentioned Woolsey. Um, uh, you know, Woolsey, you did have FEMA come in. Um, uh, but I, I, I did not experience it actually differently than I didn't experience what you experienced, what you were just describing, which was uh, uh, FEMA coming in and forming uh, local community kind of action groups to help out with communities. That did, that's not what I saw. Um, they, they set up 
uh, they set themselves up to assist people with filing paperwork and those kinds of things. But as a rebuilding, which is their normal role, but in rebuilding, I didn't see that so much. Um, the, the, the bigger thing I saw was um, there are agencies, there are nonprofits that um, uh, uh, there, are, there are nonprofits that exist that kind of come in uh, after a fire to um, more or less get people back up on their feet. And so, um, whereas, as I said, communities are kind of dispersed. Community is that sort of a loaded term, like what is the community? Um, you know, in the communities of, let's say, the wildland urban interface, these are not dense communities. These are not typically you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, people who live in close proximity to each other, not like an urban fabric or anything like that. They're mostly distributed. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you, you live in a kind of a psychological community of let's say Malibu or a psychological community of let's say Topanga, but you might, you don't know your neighbors any more than you normally would. So, the scale and the identity of a community is, I think, is a little, it's a misnomer. And it's a kind of, I think of, a, I think the use of that term is, um, is, uh, is, is well, it's over, it's overused, I think, or it's used to insinuate that there's a tight knit fabric that exists within these locales and there's not. They're individual property owners that have a stake and it's like I live in uh, you know, it's like I live in Culver City. I, 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 I might, I, I probably know, I probably have more of a connection with my neighbors in Culver City than I would in other, like in Malibu or other places, um, because because of the patterns of development. The patterns of development are much more dispersed. So, the assistance that you know what there, what does emerge is um, trying to gather people around resources, and so. Um, there's a group that's some that's come out called um, Ojai. What's it called? The Ojai Rescue Squad or something like that, and they've developed this. Uh, it's like Amazon for disaster response, and so they 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 actually gather people around a set of resources. They 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 meet with individuals, and then they gather a set of needed resources that are, might be shared across a set of people and get those resources to them almost immediately. And it's, it's quite, it literally is like Amazon for disaster relief. And they, you, you ask for something and two days later it shows up. Um, and so there's, I think as much as, um, as much as people want to kind of think about human bonds and communal bonds in that way, uh, there's some of that because you're all going to share experience, but it's mostly around trying to just get your lives back up in order and get to uh, get to resources. So um, as far as measure, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I don't mean to be flippant with the discussion around um, uh, around community, but um, um, as far as measure H go, HH, I mean, Measure HH is intended to um, give fire prevention and fire protection services to protect open space. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, it's only, I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, because it seems like you've read up on it. Uh, but I believe Measure HH is mostly meant for Santa Monica Mountains, Hollywood Hills, um, like, from the freeway over to Griffith Park or something like that, right? It's not, um, it's, it's a very, very specific community, if you will. Um, and I think there's supposed to be a, uh, a citizens kind of oversight group with that, um, that then, uh, that then helps to kind of uh, help manage the process. Um, but I, I think the goal there is to begin to uh, sort of manage and acquire greater degrees of open space across the Santa Monica Mountains uh, to prevent development 
and to uh, promote uh, sort of, if you will, sort of manageable fire buffers uh, between developed communities. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question exactly, but um, that's what I know of those two things. And I, I guess the issue of maybe when, when I ask you if I'm answering your question, and do you have a follow up to what I just said or another question to what I just said? The, the, those, uh, I don't have uh, that, I haven't done that much research on those, but okay. uh, I saw those both as potentially things that uh, have different goals than stated uh, on this yeah. uh, face value. Uh, and the language of measure HH seems to be largely uh, quite problematic uh, uh, as well. I yeah. would thought that maybe you had to read on that. Well, I think measure HH is a, is a kind of a, is a backdoor to concert. It's a conservation initiative, I think, for open space. That's what I understand it to be. Its focus is not on, its focus is on uh, through wildfire, but it's through um, the maintaining of the kind of the open space network that exists between communities as I, as I understand it. Um, and I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but I, um, I think it's, it's, it's coming through the guise of wildfire, but I think it has another agenda, which is more anti-development, uh, spreading into open lands. Right. And so I think there's a marrying of an anti-development agenda through the guise of a wildfire resiliency agenda. That's my that's my take on it. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad or good. I just, I think that's what the dynamic of it is. If somebody knows more about it, feel free to say I'm wrong. <laughs> All right. I hope that answered your question. Um, Thank you. Maybe a related question is, um, is there <laughs> a obvious partner in the private sector? Um, <laughs> that uh, comes from a real estate background. Um, meaning, um, you know, I think it, it makes sense that there would be governmental agencies at the county and municipal and, and state levels involved. Um, but, you know, is, is there an obvious partner that, um, that uh, might be seen as antagonistic to issues of, of fire that actually might be helpful? And, and to give you an example, um, we talked with Jeff Brown, who um, uh, managed, um, he's retired now, but he managed a um, forest uh, um, area in Northern California um, under UC Berkeley. I don't know if you know Jeff, this guy, yeah. So, in, so you know, uh, he started 20 years ago <clears throat> as a staunch environmentalist, highly suspect of the US Forest Agency because it seemed to align with the timber industry. Um, and uh, over the course of his 20 years of work, what he, he discovered um, was, you know, forest management, slow burns um, uh, are the way to go. Um, whereas previously as an environmentalist, he thought do not touch the forest because um, it's bad. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that there was a profound ideological shift in, in that also he saw the timber industry as a, a productive agent um, in terms of, of forest management. And, uh, you know, is now working with the forest industry, which is basically gone from California now um, to see if they'd be interested in harvesting um, small diameter timber, which would basically um, help to clear the understory. Um, so in that way, similarly, you know, as, as the timber industry would be a private sector industry that, that could benefit the health of the forest in Northern California. Is there, you know, I don't know, are there real estate um, parties or other parties that, that would be um, somebody who largely through self-interest could actually be a productive partner? I don't know of, I don't know of any particular developers necessarily. Um, I mean, I think there are there, uh, in terms of private entities, 
I don't know of any uh, in that, again, our problem in Southern California is uh, it's a, there's, I don't know of any private entity that's actually engaged with those kinds of lands, much in the same way that forests, as you say, the timber industry um, had an active participation or interest uh, in, that, in that landscape. I don't know offhand of another kind of entity that would have that. I mean, developers probably for sure uh, in terms of large track, large track developers that you're seeing out near, let's say, Silmar or um, uh, out near Simi Valley or somewhere right out in there where there's actually large tracts of land to actually develop. Um, but I don't know of any off, off the top of my head, no. No, but I would say that it probably would be development. Although you see, uh, at least in the discussions I've read, um, you know, I don't know if the development uh, community has really come around to uh, rethinking how they develop in these areas. I wouldn't, uh, um, I think they're still uh, in a mindset of, uh, I'm just going to kind of clear this and develop it and sell it off and yeah. And be gone, yeah. Um, pretty much, yeah. Oh, great. Not are there other other questions? Hi, Greg. Um, Hi. Um, well, first, thanks. Uh, like, if I will have to ambition a uh, future result of the studio, I will totally dream with something approximate to what you showed us uh, today, and 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 I think it's great because it takes a. a a uh, position that is both speculative, but at the same time, it has like a kind of uh, deep research. Um, and it's a, a research that, that takes a position that doesn't differentiate between natural or artificial city or wildland. So uh, tries to understand this um, problem of the forest uh, going beyond this romantic idea of, or bucolic idea of nature. Um, suddenly you became a mediator in, in the middle of this complex net of uh, agents and agencies. Uh, so as you were saying, Cal Fire, the Santa Monica Mountains, um, what do you think is the unique uh, value that ar architects uh, bring to this role? Or um, if, if it's actually a, a kind of role that could be done also by an engineer or by an artist or what do you, how do you see the value of uh, the architects uh, in this uh, complex scenario? Well, as much as, as, much as uh, architects are, as much as the architectural profession and architectural education trains you to think through uh, complex multivalent problem solving, uh, I think that's where we come to play. I think we, that's where our real value is. I, I think we have a, um, I think as an architect, you have to come at it uh, with a sensibility that is, um, that, that not necessarily uh, building is the solution always, Right, that uh, that there are other, and that's why I that's why I think it is more of like a hybridized kind of disciplinary problem, um, because the 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 there it's it, you know building something isn't going to solve it necessarily, right? So it's it's a much more subtle interact. Some of these solutions are much more subtle than that. There's a tendency. Um, I, I think to try and, uh, uh, and this is, it's hard because you're in a design program, um, to say, uh, 
here's the visualization of the thing that's going to solve this thing, right? And, um, and it might be that that thing is that the solution is actually an invisible condition, right? Or, or it's something that actually becomes embedded that does, is not quite as apparent, but is still working at another kind of level, ecological level or environmental level in some way. Um, I think architects also, it, by their nature, uh, and by the nature of leading teams usually out in the profession, you will be, you, you'll have an architect and that architect will hire a variety of consultants within them, their team to work on a problem. And as such that they are, the architectural, the skill set of an architect is to sort of wrangle the, the strengths of individual members in a collaborative kind of environment um, and find common ground or solutions between different consultants or how things can build upon each other. I think that skill set of an architect is also in the abstract as a process. I'm talking about more process based things because I think that's where the that's where the solution lies, as you were saying, between all the sort of constituent groups, you become a kind of an orchestrator that can help to digest and synthesize and then push out. Uh, you can synthesize information and then push out scenarios that help to make sense of that complexity in a way that all parties feel as though it's kind of they're, they're part of that solution or that there's some, right, that you're responding to each of those different conditions. Um, I also think that, I do think though that architects have a blind spot where it comes to um, thinking through, uh, I think we, we, we talk about thinking through complex systems based, we have to talk about complex systems based thinking, right? And, and, and as I've interacted more and more with landscape architects and with planners, I found they have a much deeper understanding and nuanced understanding of those relationships than architects do, or maybe just a different understanding, but ones where, um, like I've been saying in the talk, and I'll say again here now, issues of, of actual climate and atmosphere and habitat and, uh, uh, sort of stormwater management and uh, vegetation and uh, sort of development policies and planning are things that we dabble in, I think, as architects, or we kind of say, yeah, yeah, I got a green roof or I got a kind of a thing over here and it's engaging these things, but it's not really. And that's why I, I think it's as much as what you say, what can architects bring to the table? What can we as architects do to solve these things? Um, of which I tried to describe, I think. It's also to understand what we don't know and what we need to, what are those things that we don't pretend that we know a lot about, but that we bring people who actually do know about this stuff and help us shape our thinking to be a bit more synthetic, right? Then, autonomous as a discipline. That's my own personal take on it, especially with things like this, because the climate, you know, you say you're going to come up with a solution for climate change uh, or for fire or for sea level rise. I mean, I defy you to find any one discipline that you can, that will find the silver bullet through their individual disciplinary orientation that will, <laughs> that will do that. That's just, that's a fallacy in my mind. And so um, it's to be supple right? It's to be, it's to be uh, soft and flexible and, 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 uh, and, and sort of uh, permeable to other, other uh, knowledge bases and other ways of seeing the world, right? That I think in, 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 in combination with our training and our thinking, I think can be quite rich. <laughs> 
but they don't become things that are layered on each other. They become things that are much more embedded within each other. Mm -hmm. I'm talking very abstract right now because the question is kind of abstract, but I, I mean, does that help? Does that answer your question? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, Tian Yang, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Professor. I noticed an uh, interesting case called San Gabriel Mountains in Los Angeles, and the people try to uh, build a super modern city in this uh, area, I mean, to rebuild the topography. And I want to ask if people would consider some layer conditions, as you mentioned, like the wind or soil or moisture, and use those, con uh, use those elements to rebu uh, rebuild or build a new community or the artificial topography. In the form of, you mean with regard to debris flows in the St. Gabriel Mountains? Is that what you're referring to specifically? Uh, the slope, the, uh, I mean, the case in San Gabriel yeah. Mountains in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems like a community and in the mountain slope. Uh, I mean, um, um, does, um, people would consider if if those uh, community would uh, build on the lee ward or the wind ward of the mountain, uh, or just uh, build in the sun sunlight uh, toward the sunlight as we uh, commonly do. That's my question. I to think through that. Um, I don't know about wind or anything like that, but I. I mean, how that would affect what you're saying. But I do think that um, we're working on a project in Montecito right now, which is a 26 acre parcel that was, half of it was wiped out in the debris flow of Montecito. So they're right, they're not the St. Gabriel Mountains, but they're in the Santa Barbara mountain range, tucked up right against the mountains. And so half their it's a it's a retreat center kind of thing, and there's they had like all these buildings, and nine of them were taken out, and um, so we're rethinking the master planning for that. And the question has been, how do you? What are the factors at play through which you have to rethink the rebuilding there? And um, and one of them is topography, for sure. Yeah. Um, and the, but there's a different kind of sensibility of topography, right? So there's the topography you see, and then there's the topography you don't see, meaning that uh, the Santa Barbara County Flood Control District came in and remapped, before FEMA came in, mapped the base flood elevation, meaning what that means is uh, there's the ground, and then there's uh, some elevation up in the sky somewhere uh, through which they say that that will be where a uh, future flood event would come through or debris flow event would come through. And so you got to build above that thing, right? You got to build above that invisible kind of offset of the topography in some way. And um, so the topography in itself is there's the shifting topography and the dynamics of the changing topography as I was describing with shedding of actual material. But in after an event like that, after a debris flow, or you see this in Miami or wherever during a flood, there's a re-establishment of the built plane that the, 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 that the ground plane is no longer the ground, that's no longer the datum. The datum's like up here somewhere. And the same thing happens with these territories, except now you're working with slopes and other sort of top physical topographic conditions and you need to respond to that invisible kind of zoning. Um, that's what we're dealing with right now. Or you can either choose not to build in those areas or if you're gonna to choose to build in those areas, you have to sort of think through the ground plane in a different kind of way and topography in a different kind of way. Um, it's not the physical thing necessarily. It's a different, it's a way in which you structure a new datum that could be moving around in relationship to where future kind of an invisible or latent force of water or mud would be. Is that, I'm not completely answering your question because you were answering about wind and, um, uh, and leeward sides and wayward sides. Um, uh, you know, there are things in terms of if you want to talk about leeward, 
sides or, or orientations to topography, you know, you do look at, uh, you, you've studied this, uh, I'm sure, but, you know, as you look at, uh, you know, one to one, two to one slopes, right? Like flat, two to one slope, one to one slope, you know, crazy precipice kind of slope. Uh, you know, the orientation of, you know, a leeward side is a different way of saying, you know, what's the, uh, what's the chances of debris to slide based on to topographic shift, right? Or topographic orientation. So as you think through terrain, you're thinking through steepness of terrain and those kinds of things. I'm not quite answering your question, but I hope I'm. Oh uh, yeah, it's helpful. Yeah. I think Linda is a much more complex factor to manipulate. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Yes, helpful. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, well, we've uh, we've gone uh, an hour and twenty minutes longer than uh, <laughs> we, 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 we we had asked of Greg's time. So, uh, uh, if there if is there any last pressing question? Uh, no. Okay. Greg, thank. Oh, Tomas, did you have a question? it's not pressing but to your point about uh, business partners uh, i thought that the microgrid uh, uh, development of microgrids in hillside communities maybe could be an opportunity for uh, kind of replacing the utility companies that are problems in these uh, places so there is like uh, concepts like virtual solar power plants um, that like Tesla's proposed. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess the broader question also, like how that, uh, how utility companies uh, begin to be rethought in the future where with solar energy coming online in such big numbers. Yeah, yeah, great point. I think that's a really great point. Yeah. And I think though the issue of uh, utilities, though does come down to this issue of equity, you know, I, 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 and affordability and, um, access to new technologies, um, right? So if you're going to think through a program of Tesla, maybe they, if there's a subsidization of that to uh, to allow accessibility from that from all different kinds of people, mostly those people who are disadvantaged and can't tap into those kinds of resources. I think that's a really interesting, I think it's a, it's a really great comment. Um, but I, I think there's a there's that underlying part of it that is is not quite addressed always when talking about that. So. Yeah. Great. Great. We can, Greg, thank you again. Uh, we really uh, hope to continue the conversation with you. Um, it'd be great to share some of the preliminary findings and things that we've been working on and, and get your feedback. Um, uh, I was just uh, mentioning to, to David uh, right after we, we got off of this, I'm going to order your book. <laughs> I'll send you a copy, Jeffrey. <laughs> order a copy. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> so, so great. So, anyway, thank you again. Um, oh, Hitoshi. Uh, Hitoshi, do you want to? Yeah. I need book too. <laughs> <laughs> Heather got a copy. <laughs> I should have not <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank email, you. Me, email me your address if you have my email. And I'll, <laughs> I'll right. drop one in the mail for you. you. Okay. Thank right. you. Right. Thank, thank you for you. the invitation again. Well, I really enjoyed it. And yeah. Yeah. thank you for the thank brilliant you. questions. So yeah. stay in touch, okay? I, I will. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Take uh, care. See you, Greg. Right. Bye. 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 Thanks.